Thank you all for coming. Um, I was just reflecting, speaking to a few people in the front row, that many of you know I sort of have two kind of roles where I do behavioral and survey research. And a lot of you, day to day, that's what you see me doing. But you, many of you also know I'm sort of trained as a critical social scientist, and I've been dabbling with science and technology studies to try and actually think about my other role, producing behavioral data. And this presentation is kind of like a car crash of those two things. When I agreed to do this, because everybody was guilting us to put our hands up to do presentations in the center, um, I thought this could be a few different things, like new behavioral data I'd recently collected. But as many of you know, we've been outpaced by the the, you know, the period of change that we've been through means that lots of the stuff I collected last year is woefully out of date now. And, um, and then I thought, well, OK, this is just following the International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam, which a few of us have been to and are still jet lagged from. Um, and I kind of thought, well, I might be inspired by something there to talk about what the kind of the narrative or the rhetoric that's happening there and then contrast that with what's happening here. I actually have to say that the prep stuff, and there was a lot of it in Amsterdam, was not to me particularly exciting given, I think, where Australia is. So it didn't particularly inspire me. I kind of went, oh, yes, everybody's implementing prep in different ways at different scales around the world. Um, and so therefore, I started putting this together this morning uh, on a kind of what are some of the social science questions that occur to me. And some of you may find some of these questions more or less interesting. And so, um, and then what I've done is I've kind of recycled a presentation I gave in Amsterdam about experts in Australia and their views on PrEP, but also the problems that come with it, which I have been cautious about presenting here because I actually think it's a bit, yeah, anyway, you'll see why. Um, it, it'll be fine. You'll be nice to me. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, just a recap for those of you particularly who don't know much about PrEP. I know a lot of you do, looking at the faces in the audience, but I'm, not, I'm assuming that not all of you necessarily do. Um, some social science questions that have stuck with me since we started thinking about PrEP in Australia. And when, you know, we're nearly getting to 10 years now, so that's a bit crazy. Uh, a theoretical framework that I'm using from STS to think about some of this stuff, which I haven't quite got to gel yet, with particularly the behavioral data that I help generate. So very briefly, some behavioral data, including some new data from Sydney, which hasn't been released yet, just as a kind of a scene setting, like where are we with PrEP, but also some of the optics of the way we talk about behavioral data. Um, and then this presentation that I gave in Amsterdam about the way that problems associated with PrEP are discussed by experts in the field here. And that research was done last year. And we're still kind of doing analyses and um, publishing that stuff. And I, I guess the main point of this is, like, um, I think all of these things speak to the way that we are implicated in making PrEP. So it's not just, you know, as some of my colleagues in the US have said about getting drugs into bodies and then just assuming it will all be fine. It is like we are kind of involved in trying to think about what PrEP is and what it will become quite very, very actively. Uh, many of us have spent many, many hours, weeks, months um, involved in trying to shape the, what PrEP becomes. And so trying to think about why that matters. OK, so a recap. Um, so pre-exposure prophylaxis is the reg I'm just I'm now just saying it's the regular use of antiretroviral drugs to prevent HIV infection. There are now various forms being trialed, and um, there are different ways of dosing and so on that, that are acknowledged, and we'll probably see different forms as well. I'm not particularly interested in that in itself, but we started with the IPREX trial results here, which Australia was not part of. And there's some history to that as well, um, which some of you know. And so then a very intense conversation started about, um, because the, the results showed that PrEP was, uh, for people who took it, was really effective in preventing HIV, a number of us said, well, we think that there is a place for PrEP in the HIV prevention response in Australia. How do we get it here? And then we had this strange sort of interstitial period where 
actually the main way to get PrEP was through an enterprising doctor and particularly very willing gay men usually who were importing the drug for overseas while the rest of us kind of flailed around trying to work out how to make PrEP available. Um, then some small demonstration projects, particularly here in New South Wales and in Victoria, and then the massive ones that followed uh, in 2016-17, so EPIC in New South Wales where we're based and PREPEX in particular in Victoria, which saw enormous numbers of people come forward to take PrEP and were very successful in protecting them from HIV. This year, we have it's still quite recent, we've had finally um, we've had a public listing. So PrEP technically could now be more widely available as long as willing, uh, doctors are willing to prescribe it and people are willing to pay a script. Uh, and that in, the, I guess, public health terms means we're in this period of transition of getting people out of, pro out of projects into general prescribing. And that brings a number of issues. Um, there is a focus, particularly in New South Wales, on disparities and early rollout. And so the qualitative stuff I'm showing earlier, we actually set that study up because of this discussion about disparities, uh, which has become more relevant than we thought. And um, I think there's an ongoing discussion in Australia about how to achieve the desired impact of PrEP at a national level. Um, which, whether that means more scale, better targeting, um, sustaining rollout over a period of time. There is actually a lot of questions there about what impact, overall impact it will have nationally. So a slightly different view in terms of social science is, so there's a tradition particularly in this centre and Sue Kipax is here, like about thinking about the ways that um, technology related to HIV prevention affects sexual practices, relationships between people involved in those practices and negotiation. And I know a number of people, Dean and Bridget are not here, but um, Dean Murphy and Bridget Hare in particular, the qualitative research they've been doing involved in some of the big studies have been looking at some of these things. They have also been looking at how PrEP might affect perceptions of risk for uh, people in affected communities and the kinds of identities or subjectivities that grow up around PrEP. So taking PrEP is quite a commitment. Um, there's been an enormous amount of enthusiasm. We, you know, based on the history of the epidemic, we would assume that different affinities, uh, identities um, will grow and form around that. And I think the qualitative research that we've seen in Australia suggests that is happening. And it may uh, affect uh, the valuing and investment in, um, in the health, in yeah, people's enactments of health. This, to me, reminds me a lot of the biosociality framework that Paul Rabinow um, fairly poorly articulated a long time ago, and then everybody has used and misused since then to think about the ways in which technology affects um, perceptions of risk and so on. And I still think that would be a fr that is a kind of an under-researched area in re uh, respect to PrEP. One of the big things that um, in terms of, say, technology studies that, su that I think is clear, and I think anybody who's involved in PrEP rollout knows is true, is that the further we get from the trial or imp implementation phase, uh, and the more that PrEP gets embedded in communities, the more, uh, the more it changes. And you know, the different meanings are associated with it. We see different novel, uh, unexpected practices emerge, difficulties in sexual negotiation and so on. And I think um, that's the kind of stuff that I find interesting. And I also think we don't really know where any of that's going to end up. You know, this could be a generational, generation-long process of rollout, although every time I mention that to Andrew, he looks incredibly tired at the idea that it's going to take us a generation to um, roll PrEP out. Um, one of the things that has really occurred to me in both being asked to generate behavioural data about PrEP and also treatment as prevention and new forms of HIV testing and so on, is that when there's a very, we, PrEP in particular I think is creating a very rapid and massive period of disruption in HIV prevention and then sexual practices and relationships. It's really difficult when you're in the middle of that to kind of get a sense of what is actually happening. 
and so there's been a lot of kind of scrambling to generate uh, monitoring systems, you know, do research projects, collect data. Uh, the, the thing that keeps um, that keeps frustrating me is it's very difficult to see what we're actually recording now, what will actually endure. So lots of things will fail. Like, you know, people will try things out and they'll just disappear. It's quite messy. The qualitative research suggests all kinds of things are being tried out by people on PrEP and their partners. In five years' time, half of them may not exist. You know, some of them will kind of accrete and gain weight. Um, and that, of course, makes planning, you know, how to support people to do effective prevention quite tricky at the moment. Um, but one of the observations from science technology studies is that when things are disrupted and stirred up, it actually makes it, it can make it easier to see how we actually do HIV prevention. So things we took for granted are kind of ripped apart and we can kind of see things that we perhaps didn't pay much attention to and they're brought into focus a little bit more. So that's kind of why I actually, and it's a shame Dean and Bridget are not here, um, I actually think it's really important that we try and document the period of change so we can actually learn something from it. Because what tends to happen, you know, history, rest with the victors and so on, is in 10 years' time, all the mess will have been cleaned away and we'll all pretend it was fine. And wherever we were in 10 years' time, we'll just go, that's what happened. And all of this will just disappear. So I actually think talking about it going, well, why do we think this is working or not working and what's going on will help us the next time we have to do this. And then that's where everybody looks really tired again. But if the history of the epidemic tells us anything, we are going to have to do this again with a different technology, hopefully with a cure, potentially with a vaccine. It will create other things that we will need to deal with. So some framework. Um, and this is more for the presentation that sort of follows, but I am trying to work out how to do this with the boring, exciting, tedious survey data that I collect um, all the time. Um, others have noted right from the very beginning of PrEP when it sort of became an object uh, of fascination that um, it was unclear quite what PrEP would become at the beginning, and so that's Marsha Rosengarten and Mike Michael's phrase of it being ontologically open. That just means, you know, we're not quite sure what kind of object or process it will become over time. And, and a number of people were kind of fussing about that. I've talked about how, in particular, the expectations of PrEP users, so who do we think would actually use PrEP? In the early phase, when you look at researchers and some advocates, it was really unclear um, what the actual experience of taking PrEP would be like. So there was all this focus on risk. And, we, and I sit in meetings in Australia, particularly in Sydney, where we just go bang on about risk the whole time, much to my great horror. Um, but actually, it didn't talk very much about the practical qualities of what taking PrEP would actually be like. And we're now seeing that a lot more because we have an enormous cohort of people Take, uh, of people taking PrEP. Related to that pr process, though, is also how experts are involved in the process, because none of us are disconnected from this, um, and how we envision PrEP and then what it becomes. And so that's kind of where my presentation is sitting today. Um, Tim Rhodes, who's one of our new uh, appointments at CSRH between us and the London School of Hygiene, uh, is working with Kari and others on this idea of evidence-making intervention. So those of you who work in what you believe to be evidence-based medicine will see the riff. But this is basically, it's kind of turning it slightly on its head. And I think for those of you involved in implementation, you will recognize that often evidence is gathered after the intervention proceeds. Um, and that's actually more often the way that interventions are made. So it's not that difficult to grasp. But um, I found that quite useful to think about. Certainly the process we've been in, it's often a number of months in, we start going, we really should have a look at this or measure this or what do we know about that? And this evidence is kind of swept into what PrEP has become. So I think PrEP is actually quite a good example of an evidence-making intervention. Um, Kari put me onto this about uh, looking at problematization, and so Carol Backey, who was an Australian scholar, um, 
whose work I didn't know before this year, um, has done a lot of work really from a Foucauldian perspective on the way that problems are made um, and that the way problems are defined affects what people think needs to be done. So the, the idea that a problem is self-evident is rubbish. You know, we make the problem and then this kind of suggests a course of action. Now certainly at the moment there are lots of problems we're dealing with that have been raised in relation to PrEP and so some of the material I'm presenting sort of shows you what is at stake when people do that um, for us and for the people who we're asking to use PrEP as well. And it's perhaps obvious to state that these processes therefore in my view are political, like they have an impact on policy but also you know, the claims we make about what needs to be done and, um, and we're all, I think you know, from my perspective we want HIV prevention to be better, we're all invested in that in some way. So, a little bit of behavioural data. Um, not much for me, um, but this is more of a recap on really just to illustrate pace of change. So this is some data from the PREPARE project which we started shortly after the IPREX um, trial results. Jeannie, who's in the room, has been involved in this project since the beginning. Um, and Sue as well, actually in the earlier stages. And the main thing to note here is that um, when we started this project back in 2011, the line at the bottom, like virtually nobody said they'd used or experimented with PrEP. I mean, to do so was actually really bloody hard. Back in 2011, you had to be really quite enterprising, either to personally import or to divert, stock up on some PEP drugs. We know people did that as well. Um, and then nothing really changed very much. These are national data from gay and bisexual men across Australia. Nothing really changed until two or three years ago where we started to see some of the smallest studies taking off and uh, this small but growing cohort of men um, using PrEP. One of the reasons I often put this up is that um, in social and behavioural research you never see a rate of change this big in, a in any population for anything. So this degree of change here where we go from 3% using PrEP to a quarter in a national study is just sort of insane. Like most people if they saw that, if any people on my team brought me that and Evelyn and I know about this, if someone comes in with that I go this is wrong, go away and check it again. <laughs> but this was kind of, this is sort of the new normal in which we're kind of operating. So that was really just to show pace of change. These two other things were willingness to use PrEP here uh, and concern about using PrEP and concern is really more about fear of side effects and that kind of thing. So you can see that there was actually quite a lot of concern about PrEP way back when. Um, caution and then that has gradually diminished as more people you know, know about PrEP, have heard about it and know other people using it. And actually now we're, well the WHO and UNAIDS would be really pleased with us, we're creating demand, people are now more interested in taking PrEP now they've heard more about it. Okay, another, a pretty one, uh, and one that has got me into all kinds of trouble in the last two months. So these, these data are drawn, these are new, so these are actually unreleased at the moment, but they will be released shortly if I'm nice to the health department. Uh, these are from Sydney, so this does show data from this year. And this is kind of a, something which I've wrestled with, which was we were saying how can we monitor the impact of PrEP on the sex practices of gay men kind of across the country, but we started in Sydney. Um, and what this shows is uh, just um, sexual practices between casual partners, so men who have casual sex. The reason we focus on casual sex is historically, or up until recently, casual sex has been the primary source of um, HIV infections for gay men in Australia. And it goes crudely from low risk to high risk. So it goes from men who have no anal intercourse with their casual partners, consistent condom users, um, and then all of these men upwards are men who have some con condomless sex. We have positive men who are undetectable, so that's kind of now the U equals U group. Uh, these are the men on PrEP. Um, there's a tiny group of positive men who are not on treatment. Uh, vanishingly small. And then the problem men in red, we can talk about the politics of colour coding, um, 
are negative and untested men, they're not taking PrEP, but they do report condomless sex. So technically, these men are susceptible to HIV infection. And so when we started this probably like two years ago, we had virtually no PrEP use, and we were like, okay, so all of these men are going to end up on PrEP because we're going to get all of them immediately. And that didn't quite work. Um, so then we did see massive PrEP uptake, and this year you can see like more PrEP uptake again. Maybe the red group's got a bit smaller. Um, but the thing that we didn't really expect or want was this massive decline in condom use. And so lots of the modeling was not, and Richard's here, not the modelers. Um, yes, the, that perhaps wasn't what we expected. So that has been kind of an interesting thing to actually talk about. I can remember going to Melbourne and Sydney this year when this happened and was going, how the fuck do you want me to talk about this in public? Because this is really not what we were kind of hoping to see because it would be much easier to go, this group is diminishing and we're seeing um, the level of protection in the community through antiretroviral based prevention going up. It has been a bit more complicated. So our interpretation is that because we've looked at guys on PrEP every which way since we recruited them into the studies, we do believe we successfully attracted these men onto PrEP, but then some of these men stopped using condoms as consistently, and that may be opportunity, change, social norms, whatever, take your pick, but we sort of had a net switch around. I think the main thing for me is that in New South Wales and Victoria, we're kind of going on balance, it's probably OK, because PrEP seems to be really, really effective for the guys that are using it. And the initial cohort of men were probably the people who needed it most. And now they're not getting HIV. Um, but I guess the main thing is this period of disruption, we just don't know where this will end up. You know, it's the Wild West. It's very exciting time to be a social or behavioural researcher. Um, and so, I, yeah, every time this comes out, I kind of go, oh, God, I don't know, like, wh what are we going to do next? Once a year, it's a kind of little birthday present. Um, joking aside, though, so these data, like, internationally, it's actually, and this is one of the reasons I'm a bit frustrated going to the conference, internationally, these data are not that wide. You know, th there are very few jurisdictions who have this degree of sort of like monitoring or engagement with their community, so they wouldn't even be able to tell you whether this had happened. San Francisco maybe has got some similar data that shows a similar pattern. <coughs> so we published this in The Lancet HIV. Um, and what was kind of interesting, and I think this has been a kind of a very sobering moment for me. So what, you know, in terms of research and academic terms was a could be a career-defining publication, actually then resulted in some very interesting and then quite frightening media coverage. So I actually emailed my mum saying, I've been interviewed by Science Magazine. That's it. I can retire now. And, um, and then it kind of gradually went a bit crazy. Um, so like, you know, Science Magazine, um, pill that protects people from HIV may lead to more sex with their condoms. They started talking about risk compensation. It's quite a balanced article. The Guardian, re who I have a subscription with, um, managed to manage uh, PrEP may pay playing a part in men's complacency. That I, The phone started ringing then from community partners. And uh, they didn't even speak to me. Uh, so people then just started running with this storyline. Um, New York Times, also someone I have a subscription with, I complain to them. Um, you know, just it, interesting that it's very difficult to actually talk about this stuff uh, and actually do this kind of research. That it has consequences. And I'm still wrestling with this about how to talk about this stuff publicly. News.com.au, who everybody was terrified by, actually didn't. Actually, their article wasn't really that hysterical in, in the scheme of things. Also note the color coding echoing my rainbow slide. Um, <laughs> so actually, I just wanted to put that, I was talking to Kari about this, about putting this in here to go, I am deeply implicated in some of what I'm about to show you about in terms of evidence making. And it kind of does, doesn't quite keep me awake at night, but it's close to, certainly in the period of this, when this media 
uh, was happening, I was thinking, I really do not want this to be happening. Because I kind of think this kind of storytelling inevitably could be harmful. And if this you know, prevents someone going forward to talk to you know, an educator or a, or a doctor about effective HIV prevention, then you know, we're kind of fighting on more than one front at all times. OK, so this is then the social science presentation. And I'm just acknowledging I have given this before in Amsterdam recently at the ASH conference. And it has a great title, so I had to put that, um, I had to put that quote in. So this is drawing on this PrEP disparity study. It was quite small. Uh, we had a modest amount of funding, but we spoke to 21 key informants. And one of the reasons why I've been reticent about this is that even in this room, many of you will know many of these people who are interviewed, and some of you may have been interviewed for this study. And um, it actually feels quite intimate, and it's, it's a reminder of the kind of the stakes in the field about trying to make HIV prevention and PrEP work better. So my colleague Christy Newman did most of the interviews supported by our colleague from the University of California, uh, San Francisco, Shana Hughes, which is a bit of a nascent collaboration between us and them. Uh, it's, the interviews were done a year ago. Um, and we had a range of people from policy, clinical research, advocacy, and health promotion. And most of the people were quite senior and quite seasoned uh, in the field. So they'd seen quite a lot before. Uh, our primary aim was to look at issue from uh, experts' perspective, issues in implementing PrEP, uh, particularly the notion of equitable access. So that's how we configured the study. Then all this other stuff came up, you know, because we Christy and the rest of us often knew the people we were speaking to, and they were incredibly candid um, because we've all known each other for years. Um, so I was thinking about that methodologically, it's kind of interesting, you know, the, and then what you, the responsibility you have to represent that. Um, yeah, represent those views, which is why I put my embarrassing media coverage up there before. Um, I kind of came in going, OK, you write the primary analysis about equitable access and what people think that means in Australia. And then what else do we think is going on? And Christy said, you need to look at the stuff about condom use and STIs. She goes, it's all over the data set. Like, people just wouldn't stop talking about it. So please go away and look at it. Uh, and actually, STIs was weirdly more dominant than reduced condom use or risk compensation or whatever you want to call it. I have said that there are kind of three kind of, just for ease of presentation, three kind of views of these problems. Kind of a catastrophizing view, uh, a normalizing one, and an optimistic one. Now, the same people could sort of offer elements of the same one. I'm not saying everybody just sort of inhabited one and kind of stuck there. Some of them did. Um, some of them got quite you know, fixated on one of them or the other. So I'm not saying everybody just sort of like fell in a neat slot, but it's interesting to think about the way, if you use these to think about the way the evidence is mobilized in support of or against these positions. So uh, the wildebeest quote, I had to put this one up. I actually think this quote is really nice from a policymaker about a sense among some of the interviewees that um, we really didn't know quite what we were going to get when we rolled PrEP out. So he or she says, PrEP was unleashed without anyone really thinking it through. Uh, let's do a little mud map, mud map. What are the good things? What are the bad things? How do we strategize around the bad things before we release the horse? They liked an animal metaphor. Um, it was not, we're going to just let it out. We're going to let the wildebeest go, and we'll deal with it. It's going to be wonderful. It'll be a revolution. and. I was thinking, oh god, is it? Is it really? Um, now, I think it's just quite nice in the sense, I don't think this was the only person who was a bit like, we're on a bit of a roller coaster here with PrEP, and we're not really quite sure what's going to happen. And many people here involved in implementation studies would have thought the same thing at various points. But um, what's interesting is then the following extracts show the kinds of evidence which were then used to kind of assert define and understand the problems of condomless sex, and particularly STIs. So, catastrophe. Let's start with the catastrophe. Let's start with the bad stuff. 
Um, these are particularly around STIs. <coughs> You'll note um, there are a couple of clinical experts here, but they weren't the only people who raised these issues. They were acknowledged by a range of people. And um, these kind of interviewees focused on the negative aspects of climbing STI rates. And they particularly aligned that with PrEP users having condomless sex, which I think internationally is now kind of well um, noted and documented. But I think what you see here is kind of this slight kind of um, highlighting of rare, unusual, and dangerous kind of symptoms, spiraling rates of infection. And then on the lower quote, the last quote, the spectre of uh, bisexually active men infecting their female partners. Where have we heard that before? You know, like the same tropes repeat themselves throughout the epidemic. Um, I've always found the problem of STIs really interesting with PrEP because nobody ever expected PrEP to protect people from STIs, but it has become such a dominant discussion point um, with um, anything to do with PrEP. And so I've been wrestling with this about, well, why are STIs singled out as a negative consequence? Is it just a matter of timing? Um, you know, that both were increasing at the same time and then they get linked together and then you can't separate them. Um, others have already said, is it a way to question the validity of PrEP as a prevention strategy? Uh, and to highlight what the previous speaker said were the potentially unthought through consequences. Um, of PrEP, you know, that, well, see, I told you, there were going to be things that you, you, we should have planned for. But I kind of think um, there's also a very strong whiff of moralism about this as well, about, you know, um, uncontained sexual activity and that um, people haven't really thought through what it might be like to actually go on PrEP. And others have already made the link that it's similar to the way the female contraceptive pill was discussed as well when it was released. I think these concerns, the way they're kind of um, deployed, um, whether it's intentional or not, tend to highlight the pub both the public health but also the moral risks of PrEP. And I don't know if that's the speaker's intention, but I think that is one of, when STIs are put out there, that does tend to be one of the consequences. Uh, and that we're all going to die of drug-resistant gonorrhea, obviously, <laughs> tomorrow. Um, The normalising stance, which, which was by the title a bit more sober, um, position prep as just another intervention. So this is a like, we have expertise, we've seen this all before, it's just another thing, we'll be fine. And so here you get acknowledgement of a decade-long increase in STIs prior to PrEP's arrival and a decade-long trend um, around condom use declining. Um, speaker from government and policy says, I don't have concerns, it's just another tool that's arrived and we will effectively incorporate it in our prevention response. Um, second speaker, I don't really buy into this hysteria about STIs because the great secret is um, STIs have been inclining for a long time, completely independent of PrEP, somewhat confidently asserted. Um, so here those rising STI trends are acknowledged, uh, and, but they're positioned as a gradual trend that was occurring anyway. Um, one of the things that I noted in these kind of uh, accounts is the quiet confidence of being, being able to manage problems that, came, uh, that come along, um, and acceptance that things tend to pop up, which is, I guess, true um, throughout the epidemic. Um, but also then the positioning of concern about PrEP and STIs as hysteria. So there's a bit of a kind of poo-pooing of that position as hysterical. Okay, the optimistic start. I apologise for going quickly through it, but I kind of want some time at the end so, so we could discuss things. So this one, as it would be suggested from the title, um, there were a few more optimistic positions about PrEP. Uh, again, these also tend to acknowledge increased STI uh, rates among PrEP users, but then they tended to pivot to emphasise other changes. So here there's one that many of you will be familiar with, which is that now we have large numbers of HIV negative gay men who are regularly tested, and that's a good thing. And PrEP has had that positive effect, so it's not a negative effect, it's a positive one. Uh, and then there's a reference to modelling. Uh, not Richard's, but somebody else's, saying that actually, you know, it's possible that with all this testing and treatment of STIs, we could drive down STIs. Um, 
The second speaker says, um, actually PrEP users will make decisions in the face of STIs. Uh, and they will decide whether to use condoms or not if they're worried about a STI transmission. Uh, and then the kind of, uh, you know, a very strong counter as well saying, we've been living under the, the black cloud of HIV for such a long time um, that this is a phase of liberation. And you know, the, the implication being that we should actually defend this kind of uh, development within um, HIV prevention, particularly the relief from fear of HIV. Again, I apologize for rushing. Um, so what do I think these kind of three positions suggest? Um, well, I think it, it's fairly obvious to me that the, the problems of condom use, and particularly STIs, which I've shown you here, associated with PrEP, um, underscore the new interventions, tend to have multiple effects, which are sometimes difficult to foresee and particularly to control, uh, which is why these um, interviewees were wrestling with these particular issues, because it's their job to think about how to foresee or control these things. Um, the way that PrEP was pro is problematized here, as I mentioned, tends to highlight not only its public health risks, or so risk to the program, but also its moral risks uh, to the users, but argue, ar arguably to experts and the people advocating for PrEP as well. And as I said, I think we are implicated in some of the risks of rollout here, which I know some of us feel more than others. I would argue that all these positions, whether catastrophizing, normalizing, or optimistic, um, were selective in the knowledge or the evidence they mobilized. Uh, the catastrophizing position, I think, for many people, clearly exaggerates the risks that may be posed by STIs, particularly ones that are going to kill us all. Um, and downplays the fact that most people do not experience those very negative outcomes, or that if they do get STIs, they're easily dealt with. The normalizing position, however, is interesting because it actually downplays the scale of, of, and pace of change, which I showed you earlier. Things have actually, I've never seen in my career in HIV change this rapid. So the normalizing position going, there's nothing to see here and it's all fine, really does actually downplay the generation, the once in a generation shift that is going on, and that there may actually be problems and issues to deal with. The optimistic position um, relies on an imagined future where there are beneficial outcomes, many of which we haven't actually seen, and some of which are proposed um, and probably are unlikely to transpire. And certainly in the short term, we haven't seen some of those. While some of the, some of the effects are definitely uh, shown, like so relief from fear of HIV, I think now is just kind of the, probably the most powerful outcome that's documented. Uh, and of course, engagement in sexual health care, like you can't sort of argue with the numbers. But the idea that diagnosing and testing thousands that we're going to test and treat our way out of STI epidemics is probably not actually going to happen, or it's not certainly happening at the moment. So I think uh, the positions taken by the people we spoke to uh, and the evidence that they selected or offered about PrEP demonstrate that it's being made as it is implemented. But that also means it can be changed as it is evidence, depending on the evidence we bring to bear or the arguments we offer about it, all the way we interpret evidence, not just what we measure as well. Uh, this means that in these, even just in this small group of people, there are multiple contested preps, and God knows how many there are if you actually spoke to all the users who are actually taking prep and their partners and their peers and their friends. Um, and it, to me, I think that's really fascinating because I don't think that's a problem. I just think that's the way it is. But it's um, the reason we should engage with this is because we want those preps to be as effective as possible. And that doesn't just mean preventing HIV for as many people as possible. It also kind of means it being pleasurable, well supported, you know, those kind of good social justice things we want. Um, and so I actually think some of those positions are a bit problematic for defending that kind of view of effective HIV prevention because they emphasize very negative aspects that may never actually transpire. But similarly, pretending nothing is happening 
is not particularly useful in order to guide PrEP and make it sustainable um, over time. And I think I will stop there because we're under time. They voice different opinions. And like experts, I think, in the HIV field are actually very aware of the different opinions. They might hold a particular one uh, or think one is more convincing than another. But actually, they could speak about different elements of both. I mean, I've, I've obviously selected, in that way that you compile evidence, have selected cleaner, kind of you know, stronger examples. And some people were actually reasoning things out you know, themselves in the interview going, yeah, well, I've heard a lot of people say this, but, you know, I'm not entirely sure. And, you know, um, and they were offering slightly mixed views, uh, which is why I said that, the, you know, there is a bit of a stereotype that clinicians will default to that catastrophizing view uh, that we must anticipate the worst outcomes possible. But I also know plenty of clinicians who've been like, PrEP is the best thing that happened to HIV prevention ever, and this is all completely normal and we can deal with it. So um, I, to keep my analysis relatively honest, I don't know who said what. I can guess who said what some of it, but I was like, don't tell me who they are. Um, but that's why I've kind of treaded treated a bit cautiously, because I could be looking at someone who said one of those things um, when I'm doing it, yeah. So no, no, I really like your framework of um, evidence making, because I think that is what we're doing. Mm. Um, I think, uh, and I think we should all accept that that's what we're doing, we, and we're not 100% sure of where, mm. where we're heading. Um, you know, the, the modelling tells us and told us when we started Epic New South Wales that if you do it in a targeted fashion, you do it quickly, you know, in, in modelling and pu public health speak to get herd immunity up and uh, playing as much of a role as you could, then you would see rapid declines in HIV um, diagnosis. Um, and that is actually what we're seeing, but it, you know, that's what's happened thus far. And I, you know, and, and you know, your behavioural slides are slightly scary. They can be viewed in other ways that, that now if you're a person who is at risk of HIV having condomless sex out in the community, sorry, no, if you're HIV negative and having condomless sex, whether you're at risk or not, you're, it's now, you're now more likely to be having that condomless sex with a person who's perfectly protected against HIV than, than not, whereas in the bad old days, mm. you had a 95% chance of being at risk. So, you know, I think the behavioural data, it, it forces us to look at things in all sorts of different ways. Yeah, yeah. But I, I absolutely think we have to acknowledge this. It's a bit like we're living on the inside of a, of a grand experiment. Yeah, and it's and um, what's interesting to me on the, the actually perhaps taking the effective component because I'm clearly having some middle-aged crisis about doing my job or something now is that actually the some people are much more comfortable with the disruption and just going we're going to do this and then sort of figure it out as we go along and, you know and I've sat in many of those strategy meetings where we're going what do we know about this I don't know but we're going to do this now and then political commitment comes and we're doing this and. All kinds of scenarios have been offered, many of which have been partially correct. Um, I think we actually have the political cover at the moment in New South Wales because it's worked for the people who've um, been in the study and in the areas where there's been high levels of uptake. I guess the thing that it's not worrying me so much in New South Wales, I actually just think but now we're at that point where we could actually reflect on as this now becomes a national sort of practice, and it's going to be really diverse. This is a really big country, and it's less monitored, scrutinised, and so on. 
uh, I think it's going to get, it's going to unravel, not, not in a, it's not going to work way, in a, it will diversify sort of way. Um, and so some of the, and I guess the problem for me is we're carrying some of these problems, the things that are being used to jab at the strategies in different states and nationally. Um, those problems have not gone away. So every time we put our heads up publicly, people raise those issues. Um, and I certainly know, like at AFAO and elsewhere, people are going, well, how do we tackle that discussion? Like, whether it's about STIs or um, a change from a primary condom-based strategy to a range of different strategies that are protective. Yeah. Um, I'm still trying to kind of formulate this question, but I guess I'll start off by asking, you know, I'm wondering what the place of HIV positive people and their behaviors are in all of this. So I'm coming from, I do research among um, mostly experts and practitioners, public health folks in Atlanta, mm -hmm. Georgia, and the United States, which is a totally different context where you, know, you were showing that, you mentioned a very tiny mm -hmm. sliver of um, gay men living with HIV who were not in a retroviral therapy you know, in, in, in the United States and in my context in Atlanta, we're at 49% viral suppression. So, um, you know, whereas in Sydney uh, and most places in the developed world, the situation is, is totally different. Um, and so it seems like in the context where I'm working, where PrEP is, in addition to being totally much more difficult to access is providing some sort of um, protection against HIV that in a way is sort of maybe more real mm. than the benefits of PrEP that are happening here in a context like mm. Sydney where it seems like because rates of viral suppression among you know gay men in this context are so high that the benefit might actually be more cognitive than it is actually protecting um, HIV negative men from Zero conversion, given that the HIV positive men that they are having sex with are mm. already virally suppressed, uh, yeah. and that, it's, that that's not really a question, but that's the thoughts that are going through my head. So a good, I mean, it's a good demonstration. One of the things we said in the paper is about epi which was good because a reviewer was kind of prompting us, saying, "Well, hang on, what do you mean? How relevant is this elsewhere?" The Australian context is kind of quite specific and quite fortunate. In that, set, in particular, in some of what you're talking about in terms of treatment rollout and uptake, and one of the things we said is, yes, you should look at epidemic context, particularly around prep rollout, because it will be very different based on your starting point. Um, here, I, I guess, I took away from this when we started doing this that uh, we'd already had like a decade of trying to encourage treatment uptake and earlier and earlier treatment uptake. That's kind of happened behind here anyway, to the point where at a community level we were just seeing almost ceiling levels of treatment use. Um, and there was some really active work done there about the benefits of early treatment um, that sort of happened a little bit before PrEP in here and sort of continue. Um, in terms of then what the motivation is, how the counter to what did people see in it then, because one of the things we were struck by is nobody expected the level of PrEP uptake to be so rapid here. And then certainly the parallel qualitative research was going, I am, I've been worried about getting HIV for decades, you know, or years, and this is fantastic. And I now, so the fear or the anxiety about HIV was still quite prevalent. And so that appeared to be one of the big things that drove uh, people coming forward to PrEP, despite, but the context here is often negative men often assume they're not having sex with positive men, but they're aware that if they're having sex with someone who believes they're negative, he might not be because he might have been recently infected. And most of our sort of assessments suggested that the majority of new infections come from guys who believe they're negative, but they unfortunately have become recently infected. Uh, and, and relatively few come from diagnosed HIV positive people because most of them are on treatment. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I've got a, a question. Prep, prep seems to me, I mean, not seems to me, prep is completely disconnected from the sexual act, unlike condoms or negotiating or serious yeah. or any other 
And have you got any, or have you, I mean, are there any dads wrong whether men are still talking to each other about, about yeah. risk or about, I mean, in, in a sense, PrEP might, in a sense, convert your warning to near the door consumers. <laughs> Individuals, I, I mean. I think we're already there, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but is there any, is there any, are there any dads wrong on, on talk and, whether that's diminishing or what people are talking about if they're talking to Yeah, so Philip and I and others and a project that Andrew leads are already, we're trying to wrestle with, you know, asking people what do they actually talk about and disclose and how. And it's probably online or through phones and so on. And we're going to do that this, we're doing that this year, aren't we? Where we're going to actually ask about between casual partners. I actually looked at something interesting and I was hoping that James, one of my new PhD students, Anthony is one of my new PhD students and James is another one, but he's not here. Um, he's looking at PrEP and men in relationships, which we haven't really looked at very much here, but obviously quite a lot of these guys on PrEP are, have got regular partners or boyfriends or now husbands. and. Um, I was really struck, by, and it's an early stage analysis, and I don't want to steal his thunder, he's going to present it at Asham. But what I was really struck by is, on one level, um, guys on PrEP who are in relationships, they're much more likely to have an agreement that says they can have condomless sex outside the relationship. So it's a real departure from negotiated safety. On one level, that isn't that much of a surprise. It hasn't been spoken about before, so he's got a nice paper there to publish. But I had prodded him to put some other things in there and he pointed out to me that, however, while there is quite a high level of that, those kind of agreements, yes, we can have condom sex in and out of the relationship because you're on PrEP, um, there's actually a, quite a big group of guys on PrEP who are, have an agreement that they can have casual sex, but they don't have an agreement that they can have casual condom sex, but they are. And so they're not actually telling their partners, or it looks on the surface that they're not telling their partners exactly or in full glorious detail what sex they're having outside the relationship. Now I don't know what to make of that at the moment because I actually think it's quite new. So it might just be that people haven't kind of got comfortable to it. Well, how do I broker this kind of new form of agreement? Uh, and it's probably easier to say, well, yes, I'm having casual sex and now I'm on PrEP and you can kind of figure the rest out yourself. Um, or whether it's, you know, a more cynical view would be I'm making a unilateral decision about the prevention practices we have in the relationship, which would be, I think it's perhaps a bit bleak. But um, so James, if he can hear me now, he's going to be looking at this in his PhD, <laughs> whether he likes it or not. Um, but I, but I actually, yeah, I think, and one of the things I was saying to Kari is I don't actually know, though, when we see something like that in the data now, whether that's it. Like, is that the pattern, or is it going to keep changing? Will we see more explicit agreements, fewer explicit agreements? Will we see more disclosure, less disclosure? The qualitative data is all over the place, with people saying, well, I've stopped, I was telling everyone at the beginning because I felt it was my duty as a good neoliberal gay citizen, and um, to educate. Um, and now I'm fed up of doing that. So I just, if they haven't seen it on my profile, I'm not telling them. Um, or I've taken it off my profile because everybody kept asking me about it. So there's sort of, I think it's quite, it's quite in flux. Yeah. I know we have two questions left, but we have run out of time for the recorded session. So I'd like to suggest that we take it outside to our informal wine and cheese and biscuits. Um, event. So please um, thank you. Thank you.